Good evening. I'm Jim Parmont here. I'm here at the Bath Freight Shed, the home for Maine's first ship. Thank you for joining us virtually this evening uh, for the sixth presentation in our summer lecture series. This year, this eight part lecture series is made possible through the generosity of the Grill family. Maria and Chris Grill have been longtime supporters of our project. You're looking at a uh, cam picture of the Virginia as she sits at the wharf this evening. It's a bit cooler than the uh, than it has been during the day. Uh, I hope that those of you who have not been here will get a chance to come and see her uh, live uh, at some point, visit the ship and tour our James Stevens Visitor Center and just enjoy bath in the summertime. Maine's first ship is dedicated to building and operating a reconstruction of the 1607 ship Virginia. This working reconstruction, which you can see now, of the English, first English ship built in North America, serves as a springboard for us to tell the story of the early exploration and settlement of Maine, of the first interactions between Europeans and the native people, and of Maine's centuries old connection to the sea. We respectively, respectfully acknowledge that while living here in Maine, we're in the homeland of the Wabanaki, the people of the dawn. While we cannot remake history, we can learn from it and move forward with knowledge and respect. Part of that effort, in fact, four of the eight presentations of this year's summer lecture series and relates to aspects of Wabanaki history or culture. Building the Virginia celebrates the accomplishments of the Papan colony, but it also allows us to open a new and more positive and inclusive chapter in the relationship between peoples of European and of Native American ancestry. We look forward to continued exploration of that world that we now share. Virginia and her home here at the Bath Freight Shed are the foundation for a variety of educational and community activities, all aimed at bringing to light the exciting and little known story of the Popham Colony. Our visitor center, located at the other end of the Popham of the <laughs> Freight Shed, is open Wednesdays through Sundays from 10 to 3 and our docents are eager to share the history of the Popham Colony and explain how we went about building the ship. You can keep up with our activities on social media and visit our website, www.mfship.org, for online exhibits and more. We encourage you to join the MFS community as a volunteer and or as a supporter from shipbuilding to community building, from academic research to fine art our programs rely on the financial support of curious and compassionate businesses and individuals such as yourselves. Our guest this week is Nicholas Hardesty, the program coordinator for Tall Ships America. Based in Newport, Rhode Island, TSA is a nonprofit educational organization focused on youth education, leadership, development, and the preservation of maritime heritage of North America. All topics which align very well with our own but more modest aspirations here at Maine's first ship. Nick joined Tall Ships America as their program coordinator in 2019. He holds a master's of arts degree in history from Rhode Island College, specializing in African-American and colonial Atlantic history. He taught history at both the Community College of Rhode Island and at Rhode Island College, and he coordinated Rhode Island College's experiential education program at the Rhode Island State House. Nick's family has been involved with tall ships and sail training for generations, and his current work draws heavily on that background in sailing and experiential education. He continues to conduct independent historical research and analysis as presented at conferences throughout the US on a variety of topics. He's the co-founder of the Academic Collective Global Empire and Resistance Scholarship and serves on the Executive Council of the New England Regional World History Association. The title of Nick's talk tonight is Tall Ships America, 50 Years of Education at Sea. Although we are all on Zoom tonight, please, at home and in your own way, welcome Nick Hardesty. Thank you so much, Jim. I appreciate the the introduction, um, and I, I want to just start by saying thank you to 
the uh, Maine's first ship team, um, and in particular, the people I've kind of coordinated with, Jim and Ken and Kimberly. Um, I really, I love the summer lecture series and how varied the programming is. And uh, looking at the maritime world through, you know, through the lens of the enslaved or indigenous people, it really allows us to get a more comprehensive view of Atlantic maritime history. Uh, and it really lets us see why replicas of ships like Virginia are so important. And I think a major part of it, uh, of what I've appreciated is exploring um, present day Maine's indigenous history, amplifying indigenous voices. Uh, I think that's so important. And I think that Virginia, without even having a ship uh, fully rigged and ready to sail, has done uh, a, a good job with that. And it's really already started to kind of make some waves, so to speak, the pun, um, and really um, kind of establish your, themselves as as an important voice in the tall ship community. So I really appreciate that. Um, and I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which I'm presenting from uh, was Narragansett tribal territory, who agreed to coexist on this land with English colonists in a 1638 agreement signed between Roger Williams and Narragansett Sachems and Anarchists in my antinomy. And I'm gonna go ahead and set up a presentation. All right, so first off, uh, welcome. And I'll just jump right into kind of the structure of what we're gonna do here today is I'll go through a brief introduction. We'll talk about what, what are tall ships. Uh, we'll go through some history of sail training in, in America and in the United States. We'll talk about tall ships America in the past and in the present. We'll also talk about Maine's first ship and how it connects with Tall Ships America. And I should have some time at the end for questions. Um, a few kind of disclaimers that I like to put out there, uh, generally when I do talks like this. Apologies in advance if there's any mispronunciation, particularly with names or indigenous terms. It's never intentional and I always welcome corrections on those points. Uh, and I also welcome feedback comments, arguments, different interpretations of historical events. Uh, I will share my email at the end of the presentation. And I'm a historian, we love to argue, um, but I also love to learn. So if there are things that I can learn from you that uh, maybe can add context to what I'm talking about, or maybe if you feel like I got something wrong, uh, let's talk about it, absolutely. So moving on, I think a core question for me of any talk relating to history or anything like that is, uh, who is this guy and why is he qualified to talk about this? Uh, and Jim did a great job, I think, with my introduction, but just to kind of reiterate, uh, my background is as a historian, primarily of African-American and colonial Atlantic histories. So kind of the work with, with Virginia and Maine's first ship is really exciting to me as a as an Atlantic historian. I've been an instructor at Rhode Island College and Community College of Rhode Island. In addition, I have a background connected to sailing and tall ships. As Jim mentioned, um, it's kind of part of my family, multi-generational tall ship sailors uh, between my grandfather, aunts and uncles, uh, sibling. We are a, a tall ship family and so it really is a great intersection for me at Tall Ships America to connect my background as a historian and also my background uh, as, a, as a tall ship set sailor with tall ships in my family, with tall ship posters and such in the background. So the next question is, uh, why are we talking about tall ships? What are tall ships? Uh, we're talking about tall ships because that's what brings us together tonight. Uh, we have a new tall ship joining the, the North American fleet uh, in Virginia, and we're really excited about this. And I'm going to talk later about uh, specifically why we're excited about Virginia and the era of history that she represents. Uh, but that's, that's it. That's what brings us here. Uh, and what are tall ships? So let's get right into that. Uh, tall ships. The term is often disputed. What is or is not a tall ship? What qualifies? 
uh, as I have here on my slide, an example of what is not a tall ship, uh, this high-tech racing trimaran, and then we have the more traditional 1600s vessel uh, that is a tall ship. So they are usually, maybe not exclusively, usually traditionally rigged sailing vessels. Many of them operate as nonprofits. Um, I'd say a majority of the ships in the tall ship fleet, at least in North America, operate as nonprofits, and they really operate for either education purposes, sail training. Uh, they serve as ambassadors for their states or their regions. They do leadership training. So generally, these tall ships have that purpose, um, and it's mostly about education in some capacity. And there's a wide variety of educational programs that our tall ships offer, um, particularly when it comes to regional history. Uh, we've got ships in the Pacific and the Atlantic and the Gulf, the Great Lakes, uh, and they all have different regional histories. And, and again, that's one of the reasons why I'm really excited about Virginia here is because she brings us a very cool, unique history that is not really represented in the fleet right now. So, and then we get to, I think, the next question, which is what is sail training? And this is gonna be a really important question because it's part of what I'm talking about. Uh, it's kind of the, the, the impetus of, of founding Tall Ships America is built around sail training. And so to get into that, uh, I kind of define sail training, it's relatively a, a loose definition, but it's the process of acquiring the skills necessary to working on a ship at sea. So there's some kind of core functions that you might think of, which is handling lines, navigating, not falling overboard, um, essentially being able to take your ship out safely and return her safely. But it's a little deeper than that too. And a lot of what goes into sail training are communication skills, being able to interact with people, um, trusting others with your safety and being trustworthy. And I'm gonna interrupt myself for a little bit to say it's a little stormy outside and the lights are flickering. So hopefully we will uh, continue on with the power, but it's looking a little little shady out there. Um, so again, th those kind of core skills that aren't super tangible, but knowing that when you're on a vessel, you can trust the person that you're with and how do you communicate with them all with that same shared purpose of uh, being out safely, returning home safely, and sharing that experience there. So sail training has these very hands-on skills and then these soft skills as well. Um, and so that kind of is the core of, of my definition of, of sail training. I think it's important to acknowledge those soft skills. So we look at it and we have um, talking kind of about maritime skill development. And in talking about the origins of sail training, maritime skill development has existed as long as humans have taken to the water. They've learned what they need to do to operate whatever vessels they're in. And humans have been in the water, you know, pre-recorded history. Uh, we know that the water has sustained us. It's provided us with, you know, um, transportation and defense and, and so many different things, but at its core, it, it's given us you know, food and sustenance. So maritime skill development has really existed as long as we've taken to the water. Um, in its most basic raw state, sail training as we know it has been around since the development of the sail. And that's come up in a few different areas throughout different points in history. Um, I'm really focused with this talk and maybe one of the limitations of this talk is we're looking at North America. So in North America, the earliest sail training would have been done by indigenous peoples. And so we'd probably first see this when the Yupik and Inuit added sails of woven grass, sometimes seal, caribou, or reindeer skin to their umiaks, which were essentially large flat bottom canoes. We see that in the image here on the bottom, we can see these people in this umiak with this sail. So we had similar vessels were also seen in now what's like Baffin Island in Northeast Canada. Um, but these are the origins of sailing vessels in North America and ultimately sail training, um, which was kind of in this informal way, but sail handling and these seamanship skills were passed down through generations. 
they were often taught regardless of gender, which is a striking difference to what we would see in modern, early modern Europe or modern Europe where women were really generally excluded from shipboard activities. Uh, with the Umiaks in the Pacific Northwest in particular, we found that it was generally women who operated these. Uh, men often would be paddling smaller canoes or similar vessels to that. Um, women would be transporting cargo in these kind of larger flat bottom vessels. And so the, the knowledge of the sail and how to harness the wind was something that was out there regardless of gender. Um, and so we see this kind of maritime history throughout indigenous life. And I, I won't really get into it too much in this, but the picture above the Umiak, we have indigenous whalers in the 1800s inside of a massive uh, whale carcass. Uh, we have someone who actually owned a whaling ship. Um, so indigenous maritime history is something that is often overlooked. Um, but I think that, you know, it's an important part of, of indigenous history. Uh, so this informal sail training was also really key to indigenous survival in uh, Maine prior to European arrival and in colonial Maine. And we saw this with New England and Eastern Canadian tribes, Wabanaki or Cree and Mi'kmaq had canoes that were modified with sails and European explorers and colonists really marveled at their boat handling skills. And it's really documented early on how well in coastal Maine uh, the sail handling was. Uh, and it seemed really remarkable. And, you know, and I think that, again, this is super important and I love that the Maine's first ship summer lecture series has done and continues to, to do a great job uh, educating on indigenous maritime history. Because I think it's a topic that is woefully undertaught in the United States. And I think it's something that um, often indigenous uh, peoples were thought of as very terrestrial groups, but really dominated the waterways. Uh, but I digress on that. Uh, so as early as 1602, Wabanaki were using European shallops, which were small skiffs or longboats rigged with sails. Uh, the Wabanaki used them for fishing and for exploration. And even by 1676, the Wabanaki had essentially established a, a navy with dozens of small sailing vessels. And they were using this navy to fend off aggressive colonists. And this feat, fleet was varied. It included schooners and catches and sloops vessels that they had seized from the British. And by all accounts, again, they were able to expertly handle these vessels. So we see these great kind of maritime traditions, again, in the Pacific Northwest and also uh, in the Atlantic coast in present day Maine, um, and really see this early sail training that kind of travels through um, indigenous peoples from generation to generation. Uh, but moving on, into 19th and 20th century um, sail training. So I argue that early sail training in American history can be separated into three models. Um, and this is kind of my thoughts on it. Some may disagree, uh, but I see them as forced. And then I see informal sail training and formal sail training. So the forced model was the training of enslaved uh, black and indigenous men. They were brought on board vessels, uh, including actual slave traders vessels, and they were forced to learn the trade. They were forced to develop seamanship skills, although some may have had skills that they already learned as mariners on the African coast prior to enslavement. But this was likely a really uh, small percentage um, because for the most part, we didn't have um, people coming over directly from Africa that were forced over here, uh, coming directly to the American coast. And so, but there were some that came, um, there were some that were uh, hostages brought here, sold into slavery. But the West African coast is a really treacherous, um, treacherous coastline to navigate. And so they did have African pilots who were really knowledgeable about the coast and about small boat handling um, that were seen in the Caribbean and the American coast uh, that brought these skills with them. Um, but these, uh, so we had enslaved mariners here that were forced to develop these skills and forced to learn um, sail training. And we did see kind of a cool transition of the enslaved mariners who lived to see emancipation 
would really become the foundation for many of the fishing and whaling fleets workforces that we would see uh, in the 1800s and then kind of the next generation as we get into the early 1900s uh, and we see again kind of a generational transfer of that that knowledge of the sea uh, moving on to the informal model though so this is pretty simple you find a vessel that agrees to take you on as an inexperienced deckhand and you learn on the job uh, they were rarely rigid training processes established on a lot of merchant vessels. You learned from your fellow deckhands what to do and what not to do. Uh, you certainly learned from your officers what not to do on the ship uh, while underway. Um, but this method was kind of interesting because many chose not to return to ships after their first voyage, particularly on whaling vessels or offshore fishing vessels. The work was dangerous. The quarters were cramped, it was lonely, it wasn't lucrative enough anyway to really make it worth being away from your family for years at a time and risk death. Uh, so the informal model was one that people definitely went for and still do to this day. It's a little bit better now. Uh, but at the time it was you know, really a difficult prospect to make a career. And then we have the formal method. So this is really through the American Navy. So the Navy is founded in 1775. Uh, we have our, our, our Continental Navy that's established, uh, but they quickly are gonna build training protocols really in the tradition of the British Navy because that's what they know and that's the experience. Uh, many of the sailors here that are, are gonna be officers in the Navy were British Naval officers uh, or had experience that way. And the American Navy was interesting because they would end up having no shortage of engagements to train people on because we had the American Revolution, followed by the quasi-war with France, followed by the Barbary Pirate Wars and the War of 1812. So we're really looking in the 40, first 40 years of the country, um, tons of naval, naval actions and activities and lots of opportunity for tra training in these real life situations. So what we see though is this boom of the American merchant fishing and shipping fleets in the 1800s. And the American government starts to pay attention to the needs of the country's merchant fleet and, and this kind of growing American maritime workforce. So in the 1870s, we start to see a big push for a formal sail training programs, uh, which is when we start to see the first ones really established uh, with open schools. And so the first one we're gonna see is what's now the SUNY Maritime Pro, uh, Program, SUNY Maritime College, uh, and so they secured some training ships, sail training ships. And this would be the kind of fashion that it would work is the Navy, uh, the American Navy would either lease or sell or loan ships to these sail training organizations. So what we saw with SUNY early on is we had the USS St. Mary's, uh, which was a, an American Naval sloop of war that had been you know, kind of taken out of service, a massive sailing vessel, and also the USS Newport. Now the USS Newport is interesting because it is a steam sail hybrid. So uh, I've got my little laser pointer on here. You can see that there's a steam uh, pipe right here, kind of center and midships on the vessel, but they do have a full sailing rig. There's also a nice little schooner in the background. Um, so they started training on uh, on these full sailing vessels and these steam hybrids, because that's kind of where the sailing industry is going, it looks like, is it's gonna be taken over by steam. Uh, we'll find this not to be fully true because there's always the need for sail, um, but that's what they start their training with at the SUNY Maritime College. And then uh, we shift over, we have the Massachusetts Maritime Academy and their training vessels. And so these are a pretty great program that's set up. Massachusetts Maritime Academy still operates today with their vessels. And uh, they've got a great program, including a tall ship that they've been doing a major refit on, which we're all really excited about. Uh, so they have the USS Enterprise. And I think that this picture really is one of them that embodies sail training. As we see all of these cadets working up on the yards here, uh, working at uh, on a sale. They also acquired the USS Ranger. 
The Ranger is another steam one. We can see the large steam pipe here. And this is a great ship to really see where the industry looks like it's going, which is a steam sail hybrid. They've got this massive boiler and engine that they can move forward with. But if you look, there's still people up in the rigging. Still people need to have that knowledge of sail training. And it's a little digression, but what we're seeing now is we're seeing some companies that are moving back towards sail-based shipping. Uh, a lot of them in Europe, we're also seeing them in, along the Hudson River in New York. Um, and it's something that they have to consider though, even though they have engines and they might have automatic uh, methods for operating sails and motors, they still need that physical knowledge of sail training and those physical skills to be operating the ship. Uh, and the New Yorker actually just published a brief article where they talked about one of these shipping vessels and they had a, a motor to operate their, their mainsail and the motor kicked out and stopped working while they had this reporter on deck and were doing the story. And it showed they went out and they manually raised the sail and it showed even with the advent of technology, motors fail, engines fail, we need that core knowledge and to preserve that core knowledge. Uh, so that's what they were doing here on the Ranger. And then uh, we move on to 1889. We have the Pennsylvania Nautical School that's established. So they run three major sailing vessels through about 1942, uh, two of which were steam hybrids. We have the USS Saratoga they operated, which is a full sailing vessel, massive ship. They also had a steam vessel, the USS Adams, and the USS Annapolis in this great spread here in one of their catalogs. Um, and so these were very formal programs where you would not only go and get the knowledge of working on a vessel, you're essentially going to a college where you're learning things like navigation, um, you're learning actual on paper sciences as well as the physical training. And this is this great point where um, people can start to develop and learn skills that they can take even if they're not working on a ship because they're getting this education as well. Um, and so we have uh, so we have these vessels here, and it's kind of um, running around like, uh, again, we're still kind of in the 19th century to the 20th century. We start to see the first successful federal effort at establishing a merchant maritime training program with the U.S. Merchant Marine Cadet Corps, which was established in 1938. Now, they went ahead and they reclaimed the old uh, USS Ranger here, which at this point had been renamed to the U.S. Training Ship Nantucket, but uh, the government takes it back and they establish um, what will become the Merchant Marine Academy at Kings Point in New York, where it is to this day. And we have a lot of people in our tall ship community uh, who are actually graduates of Kings Point, and graduates of the um, Mer US Merchant Marine Academy there. So at this point though, in the 1930s to 40s, we really see a general shift from sail to power within formal American sail training. And so people start to get more into, you know, what they're going to see with blue water shipping and the age of, of American sail is kind of in a big decline here. And so sail-based sail training programs really start to disappear at this point, and it becomes kind of a lost art to a degree. There are a few notable exceptions to this in this era. Um, I think probably the most significant one is with the United States Coast Guard. So they've always operated at least one large sail training vessel through the 1940s. Um, and so in 1945, they received the German sail training ship uh, Horst vessel as part of the World War II reparations package from Germany. So, and they renamed her Eagle. So this vessel in this image was this German ship. Uh, Germany had built this kind of fleet of large sailing vessels in the early part of the 1900s. And then at the end of the war, they were generally divvied out with reparations. So you can see these German vessels uh, throughout Europe and as our flagship. Um, so Eagle has operated as a sail training vessel since 1945 for the Coast Guard. 
that to this day it's really regarded as America's tall ship. Uh, excuse me, it's kind of referred to as the flagship of the American sail training fleet um, because it's so large and noticeable. It travels all over um, generally the United States, but also to other countries as an ambassadorship and kind of goodwill missions. Uh, and they do great uh, sail training programs on there primarily for officer training and a real focus on leadership development. Uh, again, kind of going back to those soft skills that we talk about with sail training, um, leadership and camaraderie and teamwork and trust. Um, so, but we're gonna shift now to a little non-military sail training because again, the Navy Naval Fleet's transition to fully powered with the exception of the USS Constitution which they're not doing sail training on at this point. It's kind of the dockside extraction. So we move on to non-military sail training. And for that, I think the first two noticeable people to really talk about are Irving and Electra Exe Johnson. So from 1932 to 1958, Irving and Exe Johnson circumnavigated the world with crews of youth trainees seven different times. They had a few different vessels that they had used, uh, a schooner, a brigantine, a catch, all named Yankee. Uh, and they traveled all over the world with youth trainees, um, young folks who, you know, usually they would kind of uh, subsidize the voyage by having the trainees have a tuition fee. They would pay, they would go on. Um, Irving Johnson uh, did a film, a 1929 film called Around Cape Horn, it's considered to be one of the most iconic films of a tall ship under sail. Uh, and this vessel is going around Cape Horn and it's narrated and you can really see this great old footage and see how severe uh, the weather and the ocean are at that point. And it's one that is, I know it's available on YouTube. It is phenomenal to watch, to really get a grasp of one of these massive tall ships under sail, in really strenuous conditions. Um, so for a lot of people, Irving and Exe Johnson are really kind of the parents of this inf more informal non-military sail training that happened. Um, and during their time, non-military sail training in Europe is really flourishing. There's a lot of tall ships in Europe um, and they're really building up kind of momentum and notoriety and they're starting to hold races and people are really engaged with the European uh, tall ship community. And it's floundering quite a bit in the United States as we look towards progress and we look towards these massive ships that are coming out that are not sail powered. Um, and then we also had in 1961, a sail training vessel uh, called the Albatross was lost at sea and that resulted in six deaths uh, among them crew and youth trainees. And that was one that was kind of a, a gripping story that was in the public. And that also kind of harmed the sail training industry over concerns about safety. So sail training uh, towards kind of the extent in particular of the Johnson's time, the late fifties, uh, really doesn't quite have the, the, the boom and it's not as present in people's heads as it had been previously. So we kind of move on though, and this is where our story as Tall Ships America starts to, to really take shape. And also the kind of the modernization of uh, sail training in North America. And uh, this starts uh, kind of towards the end of the Johnson era of circumnavigations. I believe their last one was ended in 1958. Uh, Barclay Warburton III acquires a vessel called Black Pearl, which we see here in this image. It's what's called a hermaphrodite brigantine. It's a two-masted vessel. The foremast has square sails on it, as we see here. The rear mast has what we call fore and aft sails. Uh, these are the more traditional sails you associate with a sailboat. Uh, so this ship was built in Wickford, Rhode Island, and uh, Warburton purchased this vessel now, he had a really strong maritime background. So he came from a yachting family in his own right. Uh, and then his stepfather, who we see here in this image with the young Barclay Warburton, his stepfather was William Kissing Vanderbilt of the famed Vanderbilt family, who was an avid yachtsman as well. 
So uh, Barclay had this background with his family with yachting and then with his uh, stepfather and that family. And, but he was also a, a graduate of the Merchant Marine Academy. He was a Lieutenant in the US Navy's Pacific Fleet during World War II. So these ships, uh, pictures I think kind of capture him well because we have him as kind of the yachtsman, really uh, comfortable and at home with the Vanderbilts in this kind of high society, or equally comfortable spending months at sea in confined cramped areas where all of those luxuries you've pretty much lost. Um, so there was that interesting kind of dichotomy there. So he ran sail training programs on Black Pearl in the 1960s, and he kind of did them all over the Atlantic coast. Uh, he ran, he would do like summer camp style programs, working with different camps. Um, so he was in New York, in Nassau, Newport, and Nova Scotia. So it's interesting that he was running these sail training programs intermittently throughout, but also found times to sail the Atlantic with the likes of Sean Connery or Burl Ives, the Earl Mountbatten, President Kennedy. Uh, he was able to have his uh, ship appear in films like Thunderball. Uh, the James Bond film uh, we see in the background here, the Black Pearl sailing along as well. Um, so he's kind of created and, and built this presence in, in yachting and in sail training. So in the early 1970s, he turns more towards sail training and drew up the Black Pearl sail training program. And we've got some of it in this image here we have in our, our archives at Tall Ships America, we have the formal plan for it. So we talk about what are you gonna learn? You're gonna learn practical uh, experience that you get from wheel watches, furling sails, maintenance work, small boat handling, navigation, uh, piloting, marlin spike seamanship, learning how to tie knots and how to handle rope, learning maritime history and customs and folklore. And so, he really developed this full training program that would give you kind of these um, hard skills that you could take to learn um, and, and learn how to operate a sailing vessel and built out a tuition for it. And so he establishes this in, in the early 1970s. And he's doing this in part with the 1972 Sail Training Association races in Europe in mind. And now what's interesting about this is I've talked about these skills here, this maritime heritage, uh, looking at piloting, um, celestial navigation, seamanship. But in this document, he really spells out his perception of sail training and what's important. And he says that in addition to what you see here, in addition to the practical skills that you learn on a vessel, you're also going to acquire much more important benefits and skills. And these are self-knowledge, self-discipline, self-confidence, an awareness of how man's survival is dependent on his understanding of himself and his relationship to the world around him. And he also talks about spiritual growth earned by taxing your mind, body, and spirit to the utmost. He argues that this leads to emotional security, expanded perception, and an increased understanding of the world around you. Now this becomes a core part of sail training and the way that we view sail training now really is summed up by how it changes you. And if you talk to a sailor about their experiences at sea, it's rare that they're gonna start by telling you about the knots or the navigational techniques that they learned or you know the, the nitty gritty of how to handle a particular sail when you're on a broad reach. They're gonna talk about their experiences. They're gonna talk about their shipmates. They're going to talk about how they changed and how that experience changed them. So Barclay was really aware of this, and he saw this as a core component of sail training, so much so that it's spelled out in essentially what's his curriculum for his sail training program. And this knowledge gets passed down through the ship, uh, the, the people that sail on his vessel and on sail training vessels in general, we see this there's this transfer of knowledge and that spirit of sail training, of understanding, again, the soft skills of it and how it impacts you. And that was one of the things that first fascinated me about sailing, uh, in part because Barclay Warburton was my grandfather. So that got passed down through my family with um, the, his next generation, my mother and 
uh, brothers and sisters, my generation too. And so this becomes really important, um, not just for us, but for the sale training community at large. So in July, 1972, 50 years ago last week, Black Pearl departs from Nova Scotia with a small crew, a handful of trainees, and Barkley Warburton's son, Barkley IV, as sailing master. Uh, and they are gonna go alongside the US Coast Guard vessel Eagle. Uh, Eagle makes the journey with their own complement of officer trainees. And they're gonna go to Cowes, England to participate in the 1972 Sail Training Association races. And this is the first time that any American ships fully crewed by Americans have participated in these races. And so they're gonna go and kind of undertake this experience representing uh, two different areas of sail training in the United States. We have the Eagle sail training is this very formal military style of sail training and Black Pearl, which is disciplined and um, defined, but also is really considering those other aspects of sail training and those soft skills that we learn. So they participate in the events in Cows and they continue on with the races and the events in Visca and Malmo and Travemunda, and then Kiel, Germany, where they uh, are participants in the parade of sail for the 20th Olympiad. And this image is the harbor there during that parade of sail. And as you can see here, it's a little grainy, but it is absolutely packed with ships. And so this is something that we've had some tall ships gatherings in the US. Um, in the 50s leading up to leading up to this, um, this was on a completely different scale than what we've seen here. And these are all ships engaged in sail training vessels, these massive square rig ships, the smaller schooners that we see. And in Europe, there's this culture of sail training there. And so uh, people on the Eagle, Black Pearl, they're really blown away as they see this and see um, the public support and how much the public is connected with sail training and with education on a ship uh, in Europe. So what happens is, is this event happens in Germany, it ends. Uh, Barclay Warburton, he flies back to the U.S. after the events to work on a new project. He leaves uh, the Black Pearl under the care of his son, Barclay IV known to most as simply as Tim, who we unfortunately lost earlier this year. Um, but Tim captain the Black Pearl back across the Atlantic on his own sail training journey. Uh, he captained it back. And what they did is they traced Christopher Columbus's route to the Caribbean from Spain using the logbook, not the original, uh, the replicated logbook of Columbus's journey which is a fascinating trip in its own right, and I won't get too far into it, but I think a very cool point is they spotted their first birds at sea the same day that Columbus did on the journey to North America, even you know the same day, the same location roughly, uh, they had this similar experience to uh, Columbus's ships. It's just a, a pretty wild uh, story there, but I digress on that. So the Black Pearl works her way back to American shores, and Barclay III's new project took shape. After witnessing the camaraderie and enthusiasm and maritime education among the European ships, he met with Dr. Norris Hoyt, Dr. Robin Wallace, uh, Admiral Joseph Wiley, and Russell Brown, and they discussed founding an American Sail Training Association. Uh, by early 1973, they had added Arthur Murphy, Joe Davis, Bart Dunbar, Perry Lewis, and Lieutenant Commander Michael Ballard, the American Sail Training Association was born. Uh, this quote here very much sums up their belief, which is there's no more uh, efficacious way to turn a confused young boy into a purposeful young man than to get him aboard a sailing ship. So they immediately um, organized races, provided scholarships for men and women to sail. They advocated for tall ships with the United States Coast Guard. But their real coming out party is the American Bicentennial in 1976, where they work to organize these unprecedented parades of sail. We see one here in Newport Harbor, just packed with vessels, uh, smaller vessels around these massive square rig ships, and also kind of this iconic parade of sail in New York Harbor on July 4th, 
as these ships sailed past the Statue of Liberty. Uh, it really caught the public's attention. And so we see Smithsonian uh, Magazine has their cover story, National Geographic as well, which I love this one because it shows the start of the race when the ships went from, uh, from the Bahamas to Newport, and it's a hectic start. And these ships are actually colliding here, and there's a collision of three ships here. Um, there was one injury uh, among the fleet from that. Everybody managed to get through, but it's just a, a crazy cover when you really look at it. Um, so where are we now? And this is kind of a different thing for us. Our name has been changed to Tall Ships America from the American Sail Training Association. We have members and programs throughout North America. Uh, we have Canada, we're in the Caribbean. All of these ships represent different members. Uh, and I think we've even added a few since then, and hopefully we'll be adding Virginia soon as well. Um, and so what does this look like, the work that we do? And so uh, we have this, you know, our mission statement is here, but really what does this look like? What does the, our, our mission look like? And for our ships, uh, we work with the Coast Guard and Department of Transportation's Maritime Administration to both influence and disseminate safety guidance for the tall ships fleet. Uh, we saw this particularly with COVID. It was kind of an unprecedented time uh, for everybody, but in the fleet, um, you get guidance from, from the Navy or from the Coast Guard about how to maintain surfaces, but tall ships are different. And how are you gonna sterilize the lines on a ship? Or how do you isolate someone in a ship that's only 50 feet as it is with cramped living quarters? And, presented a lot, of, um, a lot of obstacles for us to work through with the fleet. Uh, we offer guidance on accidents or safety incidences. We produced uh, what's called our guidelines for safety when working aloft for people working in the rigging on vessels to maximize safety and minimize injury. Advocacy on gray area between historic ship structure and safety and modern ship building codes. And I think a great example of this is seen with Virginia. Uh, Virginia wouldn't be built to the same specifications of a modern vessel because it's a historic replica. So we work with the Coast Guard to make sure that our vessels can get insured, um, to make sure they can carry insurance policies, even though they don't meet modern designations of ships um, in a merchant fleet. We work to support, uh, secure and support grant funding for our ships, guidance on educational programming, uh, our guidelines for educational programs under sail is a full resource for our members there to build educational programming. And we work to preserve and promote our maritime heritage and support our programming that our tall ships do, which is very varied uh, from educational stuff, everything from history and meteorology to the physics of sailing, uh, leadership, teamwork, mar marine trades, shoreside operations, our members do it all. And so we really work with them on uh, for our sailors, we provide grants and scholarships to sponsor career de development and sail training opportunities. We have a nationwide skills certificate program, uh, mentorship for young members. And for our community as a whole, there's a few important points. Um, we recognize that sailing has really been largely a white male, economically privileged field. And we're really working diligently to address issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion across our fleet and throughout our own organization and our own programming. Um, but we have, uh, for our community, awarded more than $700,000 in financial aid and scholarships and awards. Uh, our vessels that we've supported have carried between 1980 and roughly 2020, 5.2 million trainees and provided opportunities for 77,000 working crew. Uh, we develop programs to benefit our sailors and ships. Uh, we just piloted one called Women on the Water in Newport. Uh, this one we partnered with the Washington Rochambeau Revolutionary Route and Girl Scouts of Southeastern New England to develop a, a program that combines seamanship skills and historical education. Uh, we'll be doing that for the next three years, courtesy of funding from the National Park Service, courtesy of the Washington Rochambeau National Historic Trail. We also hold the Tall Ships Challenge. Um, Tall Ships Challenge is in the Great Lakes this year. We rotate into different coastal waters. Our last series in 2019 attracted over 400,000 people to the waterfront. 
And what these events do is really give people the chance to see the ships in person, to connect with what their educational missions are, their purpose, um, to provide opportunities for people who want to go out on these ships. So this is something we do every year, pandemic notwithstanding, and uh, we're really proud of this work. So um, jumping ahead, though, I really want to connect with uh, Virginia here in my final minutes and talk about why a ship like Virginia is important and how this fits in with Tall Ships America. Uh, Virginia connects the public with important parts of history, particularly regional history, and we're seeing this in the summer lecture series. You know, it's the first ocean-going English ship built in the Americas. That's really significant. And she's at the intersection of fishing, exploration, migration, shipbuilding, and colonization histories, at the intersection of indigenous and English and colonial American histories, um, and is really a vehicle for the exploring the lives of, of Maine inhabitants. And, and tall ships are great learning platforms that take learners from books and classrooms and immerse them in their subjects. And this is what Virginia will be doing. And you think about like, learning about how indigenous and European men and women viewed the coast of Maine, literally viewed it. Uh, you learn about it by book, but then imagine being on the deck of Virginia as she moves through the water, feeling the coastal breeze, seeing the trees and the shoreline. And this allows you to step into that time and it fosters a connection with educational content that really leaves lasting impressions. And that's kind of at the core of what our ships do. Um, so we love to see Virginia added to this fleet. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, sh ships from this era, uh, from the early 1600s, there's Mayflower, Susan Constant, and Godspeed, but these are all replicas of European ships. Virginia will be this first ship in the fleet that's a replica of an American ship from this era. Um, and while many ships in the Northeast have kind of transitioned to day sails and short passenger sails, Virginia's educational mission is really going to help ensure that people have options for Think really robust educational programming in the tall ships fleet and we can work to provide guidance on coast guard regulations and rule changes efforts for grant funding for education or preservation programs um, connecting the ship with other ships throughout the fleet who have proven models of success um, so there's a lot that we can do here and we're really excited to build this relationship with Maine's first ship and in particular because the tall ships world it's not a growth industry we lose ships, we lose them to time, to the economy, to nature, to disregard for history and heritage. But new building projects like Maine's first ship really help ensure that access to these histories, uh, really help ensure access to the histories that these ships represent um, and preserve. And they allow future generations to access the past and gain skills for the future, maybe even discover how they fit into the world and the world around them. Projects like this are really critical to preserving maritime histories. Um, so in the spirit of that, I really, I and Tall Ships America would really like to thank the people that have volunteered their time, their resources, their money to bring Virginia to where she is today and really congratulate the Maine's First Ship team, all of the volunteers and people who have donated. Uh, really congratulate on the success of bringing her to the water. It's pretty incredible and a pretty exciting thing. And what I'm going to do now is open it up. If we have questions, I am more than happy to uh, answer any questions and connect in any way. Nick, I, I have a question for you. Um, uh, Skip Finley has written a book about uh, black whalers, uh, black men who were whaling captains. Um, uh, I can you comment on you started to discuss this as a as a separate uh, pathway toward uh, success and, and independence and freedom how, how successful was that and and how long did that last uh yeah that's a great question and actually i've had skip finley on the tall ships america podcast which i will shamelessly plug right now it's called a bark a brig and a schooner shape history uh skips uh, book is phenomenal. And so what we found is he documents that I believe at the time of this book between 50 and 60 whaling captains who were of uh, African heritage that were able to work their way up to a ship. And in part because the most important thing was 
really going through and how safely can you get the vessel out? How safely can you bring it back and kill a whale? And that was it. And it didn't matter what you looked like. What was way more important was the safety of it. And again, the skills can you trust the run the vessel with? And so what we started to see is this rise in African and indigenous whalers who were able to start working their way up the ranks and get some security and even be in a position that was really counter to what we'd see in mainland America, where they would have a, um, you know, it was, a, and, a, and Skip Finley refers to it as the meritocracy. And you end up with people in positions where you have uh, African heritage or indigenous person operating the vessel, running it, ordering and disciplining uh, white people. And it was very much different than what you're gonna see in mainland America. Um, but it was uh, a huge whaling community was built off of it for people of color, particularly we saw this in New Bedford, Nantucket, um, in Bridgeport, Connecticut, uh, actually had a lot of work done in developing a black community off of the profits from whaling. And they were able to start building their own businesses and schools and things in an era really unheard of. So Skip's book though, highly, highly recommend it. Um, and he's just a, a great person that does great work. So can't recommend that enough. Um, I can't remember the name exactly. It's something to the effect of Black Whaling Captains, America's First Meritocracy. A phenomenal book. We have a question from the chat. Uh, can you suggest a reference on Pacific Northwest Indigenous Sailing? So Pacific Northwest indigenous work is really difficult to find really accessible scholarship on. Uh, when I was doing research for this, which I took from another presentation, um, I had been looking through some scholarly journal, journals on it and scholarly articles, and I can't think of off the top of my head of any of my historians, although I know that um, the National Park Service has produced some stuff on their websites about indigenous and uh in asian mariners on the west coast but might bounce you to like san diego maritime museum um, somewhere on the west coast for that knowledge if we're looking at other indigenous topics uh on the east coast particularly indigenous maritime history uh, jason mancini is kind of one of the foremost scholars on that he's built a database of indigenous sailors i believe and i could be off on this I believe he had like 17,000 names of indigenous sailors that he was documenting, but also early indigenous history. Um, and Linford Fisher at a Brown University is another person who's done some good work in indigenous history. And Dick, was this, uh, of, the, of the vessels that are uh, reproduction 17th century uh, vessels that are uh, in operation uh, these days, the Dove, the Susan Constant, the uh, uh, uh and, and the others uh are they are, are they able to tie in at all with the educational programs with tall ships to uh, to help with their uh temporary crews that uh, go off for, for some of their journeys yeah so they they do really great work in in working with uh sales training and their educational programming and for a lot of those ships, and I think you'll find with, with Virginia, is you really need that hybrid person that's really you know able to capture both of that, the skills of sailing and also um, the, uh, that, that historical knowledge. And so all three of, so we've got Mayflower II, uh, Godspeed and Susan Constant, all have great, really robust programming in sail training and history and really, um, do a great job presenting what they're doing. Although I'm kind of, again, a little partial to what you have going on with Maine's first ship. And again, because of its place as that first American ship, uh, but they do have great programming. And, and I do just want to jump off to a second about the indigenous maritime history. And I think kind of one of the best places to go are looking at different tribal councils or nation councils from different indigenous groups. Um, and there's, so many varied ones uh, in Rhode Island, for example, the Tamaquag Museum is this incredible resource here. And so if you're looking at indigenous maritime history in a particular region, um, your, your local councils are often great at connecting with resources 
or offering their own if they have in-house um, historians. And many do have in-house historians or experts in their oral tradition. And that is really the, the heart of where you can get that great indigenous history. Nick, do you know of other vessels that are under construction now uh, so that will end up being in the tall ship fleet? So there are, it's tough. There are some in construction and some, I, I'm reluctant to throw out names only because as I'm sure you've dealt with, funding can be really, really difficult and projects can probably stall out for periods of time and then lift back up again. Uh, there are a few, but it's really a small portion that are doing it for an educational mission. Um, and so we're, we are finding a lot of vessels right now that are having major overhauls and refits for educational programming. And we see that uh, AJ Mirwald, which is in Belfast, Maine right now, maybe, um, is just walking out of a massive refit. Ernestina Morrissey is another one in uh, Mass Maritime Academy now. So we're seeing a big trend towards refitting and kind of rehabbing these older vessels. Still not a huge connection to building new ones in, in the United States. Although we are starting to see some of these European sail shipping companies that are building them in South America and building more, but specifically for educational purposes, uh, it's really tricky to see. Uh, we don't see too many being built because it's such a significant investment in time um, and in resources that a lot of people, it, it's, it's very daunting. Uh, I do believe that Fuel, who is out of uh, Martha's Vineyard, they recently were donated Shenandoah, which is an iconic tall ship out of uh, Martha's Vineyard. They were donated that by its captain and owner, Bob Douglas. And I believe they are in the process though of, um, I think they have their design set, but they haven't started building, but they've got a, a ship that they want to put together and they're doing, you know, really important educational work and really set, you know, want to make a big imprint in, in education at sea. Um, I think we can end it now and, and do we need to thank uh, Nick for, uh, for this talk. Of yeah. course we need you. Of course we need to thank Nick. It, it's been a delight, Nick. To uh, pardon me, but the truck goes by on the bridge here. Just a minute. We have our doors open. It's a, got a beautiful night up here. We should, the camera has brightened up. If you've looked at it again, Nick, thank you very much for taking the time and giving us this great story. Uh, I personally and Maine's first ship uh, as an organization uh, looks toward tall ships. America as, as a source of information and camaraderie and, and collection. And we'll try very hard to uh, have something into, uh, into your program in February uh, for the annual 50th anniversary celebration of Tall Ships America. So thank you very much. All of you folks at home, do what you can to uh, applaud. I have audio so I can give it. You know, and a small thank you so much. Thing. Thank you yeah. so much. We appreciate it very much. Good night. Thank you.